ranking every single Barbie movie from the 2000s. This probably doesn't come as a surprise to those of you who've watched this channel before, but I absolutely adore the computer animated Barbie movies from the 2000s. They were a huge part of my childhood, and the films practically raised an entire generation of kids. I didn't actually own many Barbie dolls as a kid due to an unfortunate haircutting incident, but I was an avid watcher and supporter of the Barbie cinematic universe. Of the 16 Barbie films that were released between 2001 and 2009, I've watched about half. I was in elementary school when the first Barbie film, Barbie in the Nutcracker, was released, and it was easily one of my favorite and most regularly rewound VHS tapes. By the time the second generation of Barbie films were released starting in 2011, I was not only a touch too old to truly enjoy them, but I was also put off by the new cartoonish character designs that didn't resemble the dolls, as well as the pivot from fantastical storylines to contemporary plots. And this is precisely why in this ranking video, I will only be talking about the Barbie movies released between 2001 and 2009. Not only because they're the ones I'm most familiar with, but because there's actually a chance of my enjoying them. My apologies to the princess and the pop star stands. Obviously, this isn't an original idea. I first saw a Barbie ranking over on Kate Loves Disney's channel, so make sure to check out her video. She watched all 36 Barbie movies, and for that alone, she is my hero. My brain would have melted into a puddle of pink glitter. In the rest of this video, I'll be covering the 16 Barbie movies from the 2000s in chronological order, explaining the plot and the things I liked and disliked about them as I go along. And at the very end of the video, I'll rank them. And it must be said, I'm not going to be judging these movies on how poorly the animation has aged. They're over a decade old and were made for video. Let's cut the Barbie animation team some slack. Anyway, let's get into it. Barbie in the Nutcracker Released in October of 2001, this was the Barbie brand's first foray into the thriving computer animated film genre and home video market. The movie wound up making $150 million, essentially guaranteeing that they'd make more Barbie movies, because Mattel loves money. Like many of the Barbie movies that came out during this time, there are two storylines, the main story and the secondary, with the latter featuring characters from the doll line. In this smaller storyline, Barbie usually tells a story to other characters in order to teach them an important lesson a classic technique in children's movies. In this particular film, she's telling the story of the Nutcracker to Kelly, her little sister, as a way to help her find the courage to dance at her upcoming ballet recital. In the Nutcracker storyline, Clara slash Barbie is cursed by the evil Mouse King to become miniature, and in order to reverse the spell, she must go on a quest with a now sentient Nutcracker to find the Sugar Plum Princess. Remember, I used to be taller? On their adventure, the two travel across the country of Parthenia, meeting various adorable citizens along the way, defeating the Mouse King, and eventually falling in love. What I think sells the film is its characters. The Mouse King, voiced by the fabulous Tim Curry, is totally evil but still entertaining to watch, a balance we don't often see with the villains in the Barbie films. The Sugar Plum Princess. Kind, clever, and brave. That's it. And while Barbie is technically the main character, the Nutcracker is equally as developed, with the storyline of him being a prince terrified of his duty who learns to stand up for himself and his people resonating even more than Clara's desire for adventure. There's a world full of wonders out there, uncle, and Clara deserves to experience them. Because Clara and the Nutcracker have a natural camaraderie and believable amount of chemistry, the progression of their relationship is believable and enjoyable. The world of Parthenia, with its gingerbread villages and dessert-inspired citizens, instantly transports you to Christmas time, and the various hiccups the group comes across during the adventure don't seem shoehorned into the story. The only negative things I have to say about this movie are in regard to the characters of Pim the Bat and Major Mint, both of whom I remember disliking even as a child. Major Mint is incredibly bossy and rude, even sexist at points, and yet doesn't have any sort of comeuppance by the end, except embarrassingly realizing he's unknowingly been talking badly about Prince Eric right to his face. As for Pim, he just seems like a knockoff of Bartok from Anastasia, but far less funny. Thanks to you, I almost fell into the ravine. Well, don't blame me for your sloppy footwork and mm, general clumsiness. It seems your subjects are planning an, uh, uprising. What's she carrying on about now? Probably saw a snake or a spider or... 
I wish I could remember, but I'm so hungry. I feel weak. No, faint. Unlike the Tchaikovsky ballet that the movie gets its music and the majority of its plot from, it deviates from the original story by making Clara herself the sugar plum princess, a smart way of driving home how important it is to have courage and believe in oneself. I absolutely adore the music in this, and I won't lie, as a child watching this for the first time, I desperately wanted to learn ballet, in spite of the fact that I had no sense of rhythm. While compared to some of the other Barbie films, it's definitely not the most inspired idea, but I think that's what makes it so enjoyable and easy to watch. Barbie as Rapunzel an incredibly loose adaptation of Rapunzel by the Brothers Grimm, the second film in the Barbie cinematic universe solidifies the route the film series will continue to take throughout the decade, light-hearted adaptations of the original stories designed to teach children a lesson. Barbie tells Kelly the story of Rapunzel in order to teach her about inspiration and taking risks for creativity. Rapunzel is trapped in a secluded mansion by a wicked witch named Gothel, who, unbeknownst to Rapunzel, kidnapped her years earlier. Rapunzel's only companions are a purple dragon named Penelope and a jittery rabbit named Hobie. Besides doing various chores around the mansion, Rapunzel's only passion is painting. Honestly, up until this point, the Barbie film and Disney's Tangled share a lot of similar Similarities. One day, Rapunzel comes across a secret passageway that leads to the outside world, and during her adventure, she meets the kingdom's crown prince. Her trip is eventually discovered, and she is punished, with Gothel transforming her room into a tower so she can't escape, only for Rapunzel to use a magical paintbrush to help transport herself outside, where she continues building her friendship slash romance with the prince. Gothel finds out about Rapunzel's magical paintbrush, destroying it and cutting her long hair off to use as a disguise at the masked ball. <gasps> No, no. Tell me here. Rapunzel manages to escape, tricking Gothel into trapping herself in the castle, and we get our happy ending when she comes to find out that she is actually a princess. Tangled who? I remember loving this movie as a kid, but as an adult, I have more than a few problems with it. What I liked most about this film is the use of the magical paintbrush. It fits Rapunzel's personality and is a clever explanation as to how she's able to escape from the mansion. I wish she'd found it from the very beginning, as it's more interesting than a secret passageway that only gets used once. Also, the scene where she paints different dresses is perhaps one of my favorite moments in the entire Barbie franchise. It's so fun and magical, entertaining to watch even as an adult. And honestly, some of the dress designs are really creative. I do like the first dress more than the one she winds up choosing, though. One of the film's many weak points is its characters. Apart from Penelope and Rapunzel, everyone is kind of annoying and pretty unlikable, especially Hobie and Gothel's pet ferret Otto. There's just one too many talking animals for the movie's own good. Gothel, while voiced by the amazing Angelica Houston, is a pretty one-note version of a scary witch, and it can't compare to the fantastic, passive-aggressive version of the character in Tangled. Even her motivations are uninteresting in comparison. The side plot of the two kingdoms wanting to go to war with one another just seems like a way to add unnecessary conflict, and it doesn't wind up actually doing anything for the story. Another one of the film's weaknesses is that it's a totally different story, just with the names of Rapunzel characters for marketing purposes. Rapunzel is best known for her long hair, but that doesn't wind up being used in any way besides Gothel cutting it off to use as a disguise. It'd give the prince something to do besides get Rapunzel in trouble. We're never gonna find a beautiful baby with long blonde hair in here. <laughs> no kidding, but uh, Prince Dufon can't find her anywhere else! Honestly, if you change the names of all of the characters, you wouldn't think this was the story of Rapunzel at all. Barbie of Swan Lake Released in 2003, this is Barbie's second take on a Tchaikovsky ballet. In this story, Barbie tells Kelly the story of Swan Lake in order to teach her about the importance of being brave. Unlike most adaptations of the story, Odette in this film is not a princess, but from a humble background, spending her time working at her family's bakery. The character is depicted as a kind-hearted, yet shy girl with a love for dancing. Prince Daniel, the love interest in this story, is under pressure from his mother to marry and have children, although he wishes to continue adventuring and enjoy his youth. One day, a talking unicorn comes into the village, and the villagers attempt to capture her, but Odette helps her escape into the Enchanted Forest. While in the Enchanted Forest, Odette removes a magical crystal from a stone, revealing her destiny to defeat the villain of this film, Rothbart, 
the vengeful brother of the Fairy Queen. As she leaves the forest, Odette meets Rothbart, who curses her into a swan, transforming her into an animal just as he has with the other residents of the Enchanted Forest. Daniel eventually comes across Odette in the forest, falling in love with her, and invites her to a ball. Rothbart transforms his own daughter, Odile, and sends her to the ball in Odette's stead, hoping to trick Daniel and kill Odette in the process. Rothbart's plan is eventually thwarted, and Odette and Daniel wind up married. If we're comparing this film to, say, 1994's Swan Princess, the storyline feels incredibly convoluted. We've got magical animals, a fairy queen, a troll librarian, and half a dozen other side characters. Just like in Barbie as Rapunzel, Mattel has yet to learn that less is more. The story of Swan Lake is already beautiful as is, and I don't think adding all of these extra storylines was necessary. I'm afraid that I'm not a big fan of the love story in this movie. Yes, it follows the plot of Swan Lake, but I just can't bring myself to like Daniel in this film. Besides barely having a personality, he only falls in love with Odette because of her looks and rushes into their relationship mostly to appease his mother. I'm waiting for someone. A future bride, I hope. I guess so. Well now, that's wonderful. You know, I promised my mother I'd find myself a bride tonight. And I never break a promise. Where is Odette? Who cares? You've already pledged your love to my daughter! (laughs) At least in the 1994 version, Derek goes out of his way at multiple points in the film to prove that his love for Odette is for more reasons than just beauty. You're beautiful! Thank you. But what else? What else? You should write a book. How to offend women in five syllables or less. And despite being the cute animal sidekick in this movie, I don't like Lila all that much. She's just a more annoying version of Penelope from Rapunzel, in my opinion. I also think it's important to mention that both Odile and Rothbart are one of many examples of anti-Semitism in the Barbie cinematic universe. Murano Sexual over on TikTok has a series of videos discussing how these characters promote dangerous Jewish stereotypes, and I'd highly recommend checking that out to learn more about how this is present not only within the Barbie universe, but in a lot of children's films. Anyways, I am not saying that stories can't have Jewish villains. However, I am saying that I find it incredibly suspicious when a movie goes out of its way to make sure that its villains perfectly encapsulate every anti-Semitic stereotype and trope like known to man, and then they have the audacity to give their protagonists blonde hair and blue eyes. The implication is that these physical traits can be used as a visual shorthand for evil and deceit and greed. But then these physical traits get to be used as a visual shorthand for purity and kindness and moral righteousness. Other than that, it's a fairly basic retelling of Swan Lake that doesn't add anything new to the story except a bunch of other characters. One of the few things I wound up actively enjoying, other than the music of course, were the animals in their human form. They're just so stinking cute. Odette's sparkly dress also happens to be one of my favorite Barbie movie gowns. I vaguely remember a friend of mine dressing up as her for Halloween, and I was positively pea green with envy. You look beautiful! Barbie as the Princess and the Pauper. So I was really excited to rewatch this because it seems to be most people's favorite movie in the Barbie cinematic universe. I'll be honest and say that as a kid, I thought it was okay. Maybe because The Parent Trap was one of my favorite movies at the time, and honestly, who can compete with that? Lindsay Lohan's acting in that movie was so good that I thought she had a twin for most of my young life. Told in Barbie's first musical format, this film begins the trend of foregoing the lesson-driven contemporary plotline and gets straight to the point, focusing solely on Princess Annalise and the pauper Erica. All my life I've always wanted to have one day just for me. All my life I've always wanted to have one day for myself. Despite living two very different lives, the two girls look almost identical, their respective hair colors being their main difference in appearance. Both girls yearn for a different life than the one they're currently living. Annalise wants to be relieved of the pressures of being royalty, while Erica wants to not have to work every second of the day. The kingdom is currently struggling with bankruptcy, and unbeknownst to everyone, it's due to the queen's advisor, Preminger, who's been stealing gold from the royal mines. 
To attempt to save the kingdom, Annalise is tasked to marry the wealthy King Dominic, even though she's secretly in love with Julian, her tutor. While visiting town, Annalise and Erica meet, bonding over their shared appearance and unhappiness with their lives, singing this bop in the process. I'm just like you. I'm just like you. You're just like me. You're just like me. That evening, Annalise and her cat, Serafina, are kidnapped by two of Preminger's goons, with the hopes that her disappearance will end her engagement to King Dominic. My mistress is inside with two hooligans, and I've got dirt, dirt on my bum! Julian enlists Erica to impersonate Annalise until they find her, and when King Dominic arrives, the two fall in love. Preminger eventually discovers that Erica has been pretending to be Annalise, imprisoning her, and setting out to marry the queen instead. Annalise and Julian stop the wedding before it's too late and Preminger is arrested. Annalise is able to help the kingdom's financial problems and both couples get married. The princess and the pauper's biggest strength is in its world building and character development. Both Annalise and Erica have their own personalities, really feeling like different characters even when they share the same hair color. <sighs> I don't know a thing about being a princess. Although, I won't lie, I prefer Erica to Annalise. Other than having to marry someone she doesn't know, the princess's problems hardly seem as dire as Erica's, so I don't have that much pity for her in comparison. Sorry. <laughs> I also think the film has rather strong love interests in comparison to the last few films. Both Dominic and Julian seem like good matches for the girls, and the double wedding is adorable. A perfect example of Rosa Centifolia. My favorite! But you knew that. And it must be said, the music in this movie is fire. Every single song is catchy and clever, definitely more than I was expecting from a franchise with no prior experience making a musical. While I don't enjoy Madame Carp, she seems like she's just being mean for the hell of it, I am absolutely obsessed with the primary villain, Preminger. Without a doubt, the strongest villain the Barbie franchise has had so far. He's so camp and entertaining that part of me was almost rooting for him to succeed, but him wanting to marry Annalise is a little creepy. Honestly, I don't have anything negative to say about this movie. I get the hype now. Barbie Fairytopia the first Barbie movie that doesn't rely on prior source material, I remember being absolutely obsessed with Fairytopia and its sequels as a kid, and I still have a soft spot for mermaids and fairies to this day. The first in the Barbie Fairytopia series, this film follows Alina, a wingless flower fairy. Hey, what do you call a fairy without wings? I don't know, what? Nothing! Who'd want to call a wingless fairy? <laughs> Her lack of wings results in her being bullied by others, but being without them actually works in her favor after Laverna, an evil fairy, spreads poison over all of Fairytopia, weakening all winged creatures and making them flightless. As the only person unaffected by the formula, Alina goes out to find the guardian fairy Azura. Azura, along with other guardian fairies, are kidnapped by Laverna in order to steal their powers. While Alina tries to evade capture, she meets Mer Prince Nalu, and they're able to make their way to Laverna's lair. When they arrive, Laverna attempts to convince Alina into giving her the magical necklace by promising her the one thing she wants most. Wings. You're laughed at. You're told you don't fit in. And why? Just because you're a little different from everyone else. Temporarily hypnotized by the offer, Alina does manage to come to, breaking the necklace and stopping Laverna. The guardians regain their powers and use them on Laverna, who disappears. After everyone is cured, the ruler of Fairytopia, the Enchantress, gives Alina a pair of wings in gratitude. I absolutely adore the character designs of all the fairies. The way each of them look like they're wearing flower petals is so adorable and honestly would make such a cute group Halloween costume. While putting all of the fairies in a single color is an obvious choice, it does succeed in making the entire world seem all the more magical. I know some people hate Bibble, but I would die for him. He looks like a flying ball of cotton candy and is the best Barbie sidekick ever. My only problem with Fairytopia is that it's a bit slow. Most of the movie feels like it could have been put in the first act. Half the time, Alina is just walking from place to place, and the other half is Laverna twirling her metaphorical mustache and monologuing. He starts monologuing. He starts monologuing. He starts like this prepared speech yeah. about how feeble I am compared to him, <laughs> how inevitable my defeat is, uh, how the world will soon be his. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah, right. Yammering. 
It's a decent setup for the rest of the series, but as a standalone film, kind of boring. Barbie and the Magic of Pegasus This 2006 Barbie film must have slipped under my radar as a kid because I don't think I've ever watched it before. The story follows Annika, a princess with overprotective parents. After the sorcerer Wenlock sets a curse on her family and the kingdom, she sets off with a pegasus who, unbeknownst to her, is her sister Brietta. The two girls go forth looking for pieces to make the Wand of Light. They get the first piece through Courage in the Forbidden Forest, where they meet Aiden, a blacksmith, who helps the girls get the other two pieces. You actually think you're gonna build a Wand of Light. And your point is? It's just an old fairy tale. With the Wand of Light, Annika transforms Brietta back into a human and they return to the kingdom in the hopes of stopping Wenlock. While it does have a good, kid-friendly message about being courageous, having hope, and loving others, I don't really care about the plot otherwise. Annika's parents aren't likable from the very beginning, so when they're petrified, it isn't upsetting. My first thought was honestly, good for you, honey, now you can do whatever you want. We were worried sick. How many times have we told you, don't leave the castle without our permission? I absolutely hate the villain in this film. He's such a creep. It's too good of a portrayal of a narcissistic, misogynistic asshole. He honestly makes me uncomfortable. Are you telling me what to do? I'm here to marry your daughter. You see, I only take the very best. Marry me and I'll set them all free, or you can join them. Destroy him! Destroy Wedlock! Ah. Beautiful and feisty. Love it. <laughs> I don't like the animal sidekick in this film either. All Shiver the polar bear does is get into trouble in order to help the plot progress. It's the hallmark of lazy writing to have a single character who doesn't do anything except coincidentally set things in motion through their mistakes. At this point, Annika should just set the polar bear free and let it fend for itself. It's not doing her any favors. <laughs> What are you doing down here? I think another reason I'm not a big fan of this movie is the emphasis on ice skating. I'm not that into it, never have been, but that is my own bias showing through. The only redeeming quality of this movie is honestly Aiden, whose character arc is really heartwarming. I enjoy seeing imperfect characters with character growth, especially in children's films. It's important to let everyone know that making mistakes happens. It's learning from the mistakes that matters most. I was so foolish. I lost all the money. I couldn't face you. Aiden, we will always love you. Barbie Fairytopia, Mermaidia. Delicious. Bibble! The second installment of Barbie Fairytopia, this film continues where we left off, with Alina gaining the power of flight. Right off the bat, we're thrown into the action. Prince Nalu from the first film has been kidnapped, and it's up to Alina to find and rescue him. Nalu's in trouble? How did you know? Laverna's henchmen, the Fungus, from the first movie have captured Nalu in the hopes that he will tell them the location of the Immunity Berry, which they hope to give to Laverna so she can regain her powers. When Nalu refuses, they threaten to contaminate the water with a poison that will kill anything in it. Alina meets another mermaid, Nori, who acts aggressively towards her due to a crush on Nalu. Everyone knows you're M-F-E-O! We are not M-F-E-O? Made for each other! Huh. If Nalu was in trouble, he'd send for me. I don't need some fairy getting in my way. This is where he and I hang out. Bibble and Alina eat the magic seaweed from the first film, and they follow Nori to Mermaidia. Eat that! All of you! Ugh, why? It's a special seaweed. It lets you breathe underwater. Please, eat as much as you can. The girls meet with an oracle who tells them that they must go on a quest to find the Mirror of the Mist, requiring Alina to wear a magical necklace that will transform her into a mermaid, but with a catch. If she doesn't return to land before time runs out, she'll lose her wings permanently and become a mermaid forever. A mermaid? What happened? It's a long story. The two groups bump into each other, and Alina and her crew attempt to steal the immunity berry from the fungus and swap it with something else. They succeed in their ruse, but unfortunately during all of the mayhem, Alina is unable to get to land before time runs out, making her a mermaid permanently. My wings. 
They're gone, Bibble. They're gone for good. <laughs> Just kidding. Nori gives Alina a true self fairy that transforms her back into a fairy, complete with a new pair of wings. Laverna eats the same berry, but turns into a frog. I am absolutely obsessed with all the transformations in this movie and all of Alina's different outfits. I actually think her look at the end of this movie is the best she has in the entire series. And I can't deny the genius of making a doll that can transform from mermaid to fairy must have made Mattel a lot of money. Compared to the world of Fairytopia, I far prefer Mermaidia. More interesting characters and settings, but there is a weird size issue in this film. As we saw in Fairytopia, the fairies can fit inside of the average flower, and yet in this movie, the mermaids, who are the exact same size as the fairies, don't have the same size relativity in their world. It's not necessarily a problem, just something I'd like to point out. I also really enjoy that Alina doesn't wind up getting together with Nalu at the end. It's something that's set up in the first film, but it's cool that this movie subverts that expectation and leaves the two characters as friends. The only weak point of the film is the villains. I just can't take the fungus seriously. They're so stupid they hardly seem like a threat, even with poison. The Barbie Diaries the first Barbie film with a completely contemporary plotline. The Barbie Diaries follows Barbie and her friends in a high school setting. She's relatively unpopular, bullied by ex-best friend Raquel, and lacks confidence in herself. After a humiliating experience where the guy she's had a crush on and has been dating dumps her to get back together with Raquel, Barbie is given a charm bracelet and diary. I told him he needed to talk to you ASAP. Of course he doesn't really understand acronyms, but I guess he got the point. Yeah, congratulations. Todd and Raquel got back together. Barbie begins writing her hopes and dreams in the diary and discovers that everything she writes in it comes true. She begins working on a news story about the popular kids at her school and as a result starts becoming more popular herself. Barbie begins neglecting her friends and acting differently, with her news story becoming a mean expose of the other girls at school. Everyone briefly turns against her, but she's able to make up with her friends after realizing that she doesn't need the bracelet or the diary and that she needs to have faith in herself. This movie took me completely by surprise. While I really hate the art style, I genuinely like the storyline and the characters. It's actually pretty realistic, especially the interactions between Barbie and her classmates. And if it'd been made into a live action, I could see it being a tween classic. It's kind of like an episode of Lizzie McGuire combined with that 16 Wishes Debbie Ryan movie. Also, the music is pretty good. Very 2000s bubblegum pop. The only thing I don't like is that Raquel doesn't wind up with any comeuppance for being such a jerk the entire movie. Barbie in the Twelve Dancing Princesses. They're just shoes. Just shoes? Aren't they? I actually remember renting this from Blockbuster after it came out. Yes, that's how old I am. Growing up, the Brothers Grimm story of the Twelve Dancing Princesses was one of my favorite fairy tales. Dancing all night long until your shoes are worn through and tricking your parents into thinking you've been asleep the whole time? Doesn't that sound like every tween's dream? The Barbie version of the tale follows 12 princesses who live with their widowed father. Each of the girls loves to dance, are rather adventurous, and tend to get into mischief. The king sends for his cousin, Rowena, to come to the castle and teach them how to be proper princesses, leaving the princesses miserable as she enforces strict rules upon them. The girls come to find out their bedroom holds a magical gateway to another land, where the girls can dance the night away without anyone finding out. This causes tension in the household as every night their shoes are worn to bits. We also discover that Rowena has been poisoning the king, causing him to become ill. To your help. While the girls manage to visit the magical land a few more times, their fun eventually comes to an end when Rowena discovers what they've been up to, trapping them. But the girls discover that through the power of dance, they're able to make their way back, and through the use of a magical flower, bring their father back to health and curse Rowena in the process. While the Twelve Princesses' personality traits are fairly basic, I love seeing so many human characters in one film, especially because it seems like thought was actually put into their respective appearances, making it easy enough to keep them straight. Although you do have to wonder what kind of genetics the king has. While the magic that gets them to the Hidden Kingdom is fairly convenient, it is cute. I feel like we should all be paying a lot more attention to birth flowers. This is also one of my favorite Barbie movie relationships. Genevieve and Derek have a believable friendship and relationship, and it's really cute to see how both are nervous and shy around each other. He 
You have to dance together. Oh, how romantic. I also adore Rowena's character design. Her wardrobe is ostentatious and yet seemingly dated in comparison to the rest of the family. As if to show that she's not wealthy enough for new clothes, explaining her desire to kill off the king and become queen. It's also nice to see a villain who isn't physically ugly, but has such an awful personality that you hate her anyway. But it's our birthday. A princess does not talk back. No dancing until you know how to act like royalty. Mother made it a family tradition. Hmm. And sadly, your mummy isn't here anymore, is she? Barbie Fairytopia, Magic of the Rainbow. Picking up where we left off, Alina is now a certified hero in the world of Fairytopia. Is it true you gave up your wings to save Fairytopia? After the Enchantress, ruler of Fairytopia, instructs the Guardians to appoint an apprentice, Alina is picked by Azura and sent to the Crystal Palace. At the Crystal Palace, Alina is informed that her biggest task as an apprentice is to help perform the Flight of Spring, preventing a decade-long winter to befall Fairytopia. Laverna, the villain from the previous two films, returns, set upon destroying both the Enchantress and Alina. She manages to trick Alina into performing a spell that turns her back into a fairy. When Alina tries to warn the Guardians, they ignore her, and Laverna curses the Guardian fairies into a deep sleep. The Enchantress takes it upon herself to train the apprentices for the Flight of Spring. Alina discovers that Laverna has been pretending to be one of the other apprentices, set out to ruin the ceremony. You're not Sunburst! Prove it. Sunburst isn't Sunburst! Uh, she's Laverna! This is the real Sunburst! That's Laverna! The apprentices work together to stop Laverna for good, turning Alina into a rainbow fairy in the process. I do enjoy all of the new characters we get to meet in this film, especially the other apprentices. They all have their own personalities, and I actually find the character designs quite interesting. My biggest annoyance with this film is how other characters completely ignore Alina's warnings even though she's literally saved Fairytopia and all their asses in the past. It doesn't make any sense for them to disregard her entirely. I don't care about your whole, I saved Fairytopia and everyone should bow down and be grateful to me thing. This was really Laverne. You think it was really Laverna, but I can prove it wasn't. I must admit, she does seem to be there. Come on, this isn't Alina's fault. Of course it's her fault! And I also hate her final Rainbow Fairy transformation. It looks really tacky, especially compared to the last movie. Barbie as the Island Princess the second Barbie musical since The Princess and the Pauper, the film follows Ro, a young girl shipwrecked on an island as a child. She's learned how to fend for herself and has a group of island animal friends who've become her adopted family. Saji, Tika, and Azul. While exploring the South Seas, Prince Antonio comes across Ro's island, taking her back to his kingdom so she can learn more about her past. We're not used to visitors. The two begin to fall in love on the journey, only to discover that Antonio's parents have set up an arranged marriage for him while he's been gone. And as a prince, you must marry a princess. And only a princess. Princess Luciana, Antonio's betrothed, and her mother, Queen Ariana, arrive at the palace. We learn that Ariana is hoping to exact revenge on Antonio's father, and she spends her time sabotaging Roe. After the royal ball, Antonio asks Ro to marry him, although she declines, stating that he has a duty to his country. He winds up abdicating the throne, hoping to run away with Ro, but her elephant friend, Tika, throws away the note, afraid that he'll take Ro away. Why wouldn't you tell me? I didn't want you to leave me. If you marry the prince, you'll forget about us. Please don't hate me. Ariana poisons the animals in the kingdom, leaving everyone to think Rose animals are spreading disease, and they're chased out of the kingdom. At Luciana and Antonio's wedding, Ariana has poisoned the cake, hoping to kill the prince and his father, but Roe manages to stop it before it's too late. Eventually, it is revealed that Roe is actually Rosella, a lost princess, and she and Antonio get married. So overall, the plot as a whole is like a reverse Tarzan or that god-awful Pocahontas sequel. I have so much to ask you. Oh, she's different from any girl I've met before. Clearly. I really enjoy the change of setting in this film. 
I feel like Barbie likes to go the pastel pink cutesy route, so it's nice to see a bright and vibrant tropical location for once, which is why it's kind of disappointing that we don't actually wind up on the island for that long. Maybe we should have had Antonio be shipwrecked for a little while so we could see their relationship grow that way, as well as having Ro teach him how to survive on the island. I don't know, just a thought. Out of the many animals, I'm totally obsessed with Tallulah. Any kind of princessy animal character, like Marie from the Aristocats or Georgette from Oliver and Company, brings me unimaginable amounts of joy. She's such a sweetheart, while also being just a little snooty. Want one? Without a knife and fork? Don't be ridiculous! Also, did someone who worked on Kung Fu Panda watch this and decide to use the animal characters in their own film? Saji the Red Panda is literally the exact same character as Master Shifu, and Azul is Lord Shen. Compared to the songs in Princess and the Pauper, I find the music in this film a bit boring and typical. Really, the only one I remember is the first. Plus, the villain is remarkably similar to others we've seen. Is that Ro? That's the prettiest dress I've ever seen! Barbie Mariposa this is around the time I started getting a bit too old for Barbie movies, so this is the last one I actually remember watching as a kid. A spin-off of the Barbie Fairytopia series, the movie begins with Alina telling Bibble the story of Mariposa and the Flutterfield Butterfly Fairies, an ode to the older Barbie films. Unlike the fairies in Fairytopia, the butterfly fairies live in constant fear of the Skeezites, creatures that eat fairies. Their kingdom uses light to keep the Skeezites out, but it also keeps the fairies from going anywhere else. Mariposa is an introverted butterfly fairy with a love of reading and a desire to travel outside of Flutterfield. After the Queen of Flutterfield becomes sick, putting the light system at risk, Mariposa is asked by Prince Carlos to go on a journey to find an antidote. Mariposa is forced to go on the quest along with two twins, Reyna and Rayla, Mariposa's spoiled bosses. Of course we are worth it! Go, go, go! We come to find out that the queen's attendant, Henna, is the person who's been poisoning her, hoping to take the throne for herself. Mariposa is able to find the antidote before the queen dies and the lights go out, saving the kingdom and making new friends in the process. The plot itself is a near copy-paste of the first Fairytopia film, but it is able to hold its own with the addition of the Skeezites and a totally different fairy kingdom. I enjoy how different Mariposa is from Alina, and it's always nice to see a book lover portrayed in a film in a way that isn't nerdy. I also love Reyna and Rayla's character growth from spoiled and snobby to selfless. I think I see where they are coming from. Why should they help us unless something is in it for them? Exactly! I do wonder why some characters have accents and others don't. Barbie and the Diamond Castle a return to the original Barbie movie format, we're told the story of the Diamond Castle by Barbie and her friend Teresa, who are hoping to teach Barbie's sister Stacy about the power of friendship. Similar to The Princess and the Pauper, this movie not only has two protagonists, Liana and Alexa, but it's also a musical. The two friends live together and own a flower shop. One day they meet an old woman who Liana offers food to and in exchange they're given a mirror. They hear a voice in the mirror and find a girl trapped inside of it. The three bond before being attacked by a dragon who burns Liana and Alexa's house down. The girl in the mirror, Melody, reveals that she was an apprentice to the three muses who live in the Diamond Castle, but was trapped in the mirror after one of the muses, Lydia, decided to take all the power for herself. The two girls decide to help Melody, and while on their journey, they meet two twin brothers who join their quest. Along the way, they stop into a large mansion, where Alexa is tricked into wanting to stay and abandon their quest. The girls have a fight and separate, with Liana continuing on her way with Melody. Alexa is eventually kidnapped by Lydia, while Liana is captured by a dragon. The girls manage to reunite and make up, determined to defeat Lydia together. Eventually, the other muses are freed and Lydia's spells are undone. Liana and Alexa are crowned princesses of music, and Melody becomes a muse. Once again, compared to The Princess and the Pauper, I find the music far inferior, but at least the main theme is somewhat more catchy than The Island Princesses. Although I did find the wide range of musical genres somewhat off-putting. Like, why is there an electric guitar solo out of nowhere? I enjoy the plot of this film in that it shows the realistic ups and downs of friendship, and I like that the main characters' personalities are clearly defined. The twin brothers slash love interests are bland and kinda douchey. What? Hey! Hey! 
That's for leaving without a goodbye. Not bad. For girls. And I'd honestly prefer if the girl stayed single for <clears throat> reasons. The animal sidekicks, while cute, are totally useless, and they should have stuck to one primary antagonist, Lydia or the dragon, not both. Barbie in a Christmas Carol The second distinctly Christmassy Barbie movie after The Nutcracker, this film begins on Christmas Eve, where Barbie is trying to convince her sister Kelly to attend a charity ball. Barbie decides to tell her the story of Eden Starling, a famous singer with a bad attitude and a disdain for Christmas. Eden takes the place of Ebenezer Scrooge in the classic tale of A Christmas Carol. Eden, who is as snobby and selfish as she is beautiful and talented, forces everyone to work on Christmas Eve, or else she'll fire them. But that evening, she is visited by the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future, who teach her a lesson about how her actions will leave her lonely and unloved. I didn't watch this movie as a kid, and I kind of wish I had, because it's honestly fantastic, and a really nice change from the typical Barbie formula. I love that for once we get to see a less-than-perfect main character, especially in a franchise that usually portrays their main character as the hero. It shows that actions have consequences, and that it's important to be mindful of how you treat other people. It's a fairly faithful adaptation to the source material, which is a win in my book because I'm a sucker for this story, whether it's Ghosts of Girlfriends Past or Scrooged. And while it isn't particularly accurate, I do enjoy seeing the Victorian setting. It's a nice change from the stereotypical pretty princess look they go for in Barbie movies. And as a side note, I'm utterly obsessed with the white dress Barbie is wearing in the contemporary storyline. It's a recreation of the 2008 holiday Barbie doll. I desperately need Makara Tours to recreate it. She'd look spectacular. Barbie presents Thumbelina. The first Barbie film to employ the new art style they continue to use today, that I absolutely hate, Every character in this film has gigantic eyes, teeny tiny noses, and incredibly pointed chins. I think of this as the Disney effect, where cuteness and animation slowly became the priority over realism, as seen through the art style change between Disney's Aurora and Disney's Elsa. The Barbie version of Thumbelina follows the Twiller Bees, fairies that have the ability to make plants grow faster. Thumbelina, along with her friends, are displaced after a tractor comes to their field. They find themselves in an apartment and meet a spoiled human girl named McKenna, whose parents are in charge of the construction. While Thumbelina attempts to convince McKenna to stop her parents from continuing the construction, her friends go to the field to try to delay it however they can. McKenna, who is constantly competing with her frenemy Violet, eventually becomes friends with Thumbelina and realizes that she doesn't need objects and money to be liked. Violet's cat has a pair of Natalie Chang sunglasses and Poofles doesn't. Is it just me, or is this a massive injustice? You do this, and you're nobody to me. I'm fine with that, Violet. The two girls work together to stop the construction, revealing that even the smallest person can make a big difference. Although it takes its name from the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, Barbie's Thumbelina is an entirely different story. Besides being small in size, there are no similarities at all, which is kind of disappointing because the original story is actually really interesting and fits the Barbie aesthetic. It's very similar to Rapunzel, using characters with the same names for marketing purposes but caring little about the fans of the source material. Also, everyone in this movie is really unlikable from McKenna to Thumbelina's other fairy friends. If it weren't for the obvious allegory to environmentalism, I'd wonder who I was supposed to be rooting for. Barbie and the Three Musketeers The last film we'll be talking about today, Barbie and the Three Musketeers was released in 2009, and was one of the last Barbie films to be made in the original art style. Corinne has hopes of becoming a musketeer just like her father, but is made fun of and turned down by pretty much everyone, who insist that a woman could never be a musketeer. Corinne is hired as a palace maid where she meets Aramina, Vivica, and Renee, who share that they hope to become musketeers as well. I've been training to be a musketeer. What? what? So have I. Me too. Ditto! An older woman meets the girls and teaches them how to be true musketeers. The girls eventually discover a plot to kill the prince and do their best to protect him from his evil cousin, Philippe. After they're banned from the castle, the girls sneak in during a ball, managing to catch Philippe in the act and as a result are named Royal Musketeers. All for one and one for all!
And while it's very obvious with its girl power intentions, I won't lie, I love the subversion of typical Barbie tropes to create an empowering message, but I was disappointed that she immediately fell in love with the prince. Not that a strong woman can't be in a relationship, it's just that these Barbie movies always feature one. It'd be more interesting to not have her wind up falling in love, especially since she winds up riding off alone at the end anyway. And while I think the other three girls are somewhat lacking in the personality and motivation department, I do enjoy that they each have their own respective fighting styles. It's a nice touch. A big problem I have with the film is its antagonist, who is incredibly obvious and stereotypical. Even being voiced by Tim Curry doesn't help him in the villain department, which is saying something. This movie isn't a musical, but it does feature a non-acoustic soundtrack and I don't like it one bit. It doesn't fit the tone or the setting of the film, and on more than one occasion, it makes it difficult to understand what people are even saying. The rankings. Now that we've gone through all 16 Barbie films that were released in the 2000s, let's get to the rankings, starting from the worst and ending with the best. This is going to be heavily biased, so please don't attack me if we have differing opinions. Unsurprisingly, the Barbie movie that is the least similar to the ones I grew up watching is the one I wound up liking the least. I absolutely hate the art style, I don't like the characters, and I think it's a complete and utter waste of the Thumbelina IP. While I appreciate the more feminist take they took with this film, even if it was obvious, I feel like every other part of the film was not good. We don't learn much about any of the other characters besides Corinne, the villain is basic, and the soundtrack is simply horrendous. I'm sorry, I just don't vibe with this story at all, I don't care about the ice skating, I don't care about her parents, and I don't care about the lessons the magic diamond wand is trying to teach. Oh, and I despise the villain. I wish he'd been eaten by a dragon or something, he deserves to die. While I enjoy the tropical setting, I don't think this film brings anything new to the table. A vengeful ruler, a lost princess, and a prince who doesn't want to do the job he's been tasked. Because I don't have the childhood nostalgia for this one, it's just okay to me. I do like the emphasis on friendship, but I feel like it suffers in a similar way as Rapunzel in that there are way too many unnecessary characters for its own good. If the kid version of myself was making this list, this movie definitely would have ranked higher, but as it stands currently, it's fine. I think not following the story of Rapunzel more closely was a wasted opportunity. Love the magical paintbrush, though. After the strong showing that was Mermaidia, Magic of the Rainbow winds up falling a bit flat, especially as the third installment of a series with a well-developed world and characters. Seeing all the different characters at the Crystal Palace is fun though, I'll give them that. But honestly, I'm giving this one a bit of a hard time because I really hate that rainbow outfit. As the start of a great series within the Barbie universe, Fairytopia deserves its props, even if it is a bit boring on its own. Would still die for Bibble though. The love interest really drags this one down for me, and I just can't help but compare it to the Don Bluth version, which I do think winds up being superior. Kudos for including the music from the ballet, though. Like I said, I'm a sucker for a Christmas Carol adaptation, and this Barbie film is no exception. I enjoy seeing Barbie be the bad guy for once, although I'm sure it definitely disappointed some kids. And bonus points for that absolutely stellar holiday Barbie dress. I've always had a fondness for the story, and I think the Barbie adaptation is faithful enough to the source material while still being creative. 12 characters is a lot to keep up with, but I appreciate that Barbie didn't make them all copy-paste versions of each other. I know it's basically the same movie as Fairytopia, but I really do love the new direction the story takes and how we're introduced to a different world of fairies. And I just think that compared to other Barbie protagonists, Mariposa's personality feels not just more realistic, but attainable. A total wild card, The Barbie Diaries doesn't really hold up when it comes to the animation. Honestly, it's kind of off-putting, but the story is fantastic and incredibly grown up in comparison to some of these other movies. I know that Barbie doesn't like doing live actions very much, but this would make a perfect one, especially with the inclusion of social media and other modern day plot devices. This is mostly my childhood nostalgia talking, but I really do think it's a great Barbie movie, especially considering it was their very first one. I think the music is fantastic and the plotline is perfect for the holiday season, and I think overall it has a great message as well. Plus, Tim Curry. 
On plot alone, this is one of the best Barbie movies. It expands on the world that Fairytopia built while still being a new and interesting story. It doesn't hurt that it features both mermaids and fairies, two of my favorite mythical creatures, and Alina's design in this one is superior to every other version. This is a well-deserved win. I'd gone into this rewatched biased against it, and it totally exceeded my expectations. The music was fantastic. Disney caliber, honestly, and each character was as strong as the next. Preminger is without a doubt one of the best Barbie villains, and it's no surprise that they attempted to recreate that character in other films, to no success. Who's dressing up as the Annalise to my Erica next Halloween? Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Comment down below your favorite Barbie movie, and what movie franchise do you think I should rank next? Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye!